we love our ideas. We want people to tell us that they love our ideas too, but talking and listening to people who don't right off the bat can be just, if not sometimes even more helpful. In part one of my conversation with Yasmin Mustafa, the co-founder and CEO of Roar for Good, she talked about the inspiration behind her company and their product, Always On, a wearable tracking device that enables hotel staff to alert security. In this second part of our conversation, Yasmin tells how she took that leap from having an idea to actually quitting her job and starting her own company. And she shares some important insights on how she continued to develop her client relationships in one of the most challenging markets in the past hundred years. Yes, well, I'm excited to continue our conversation. This isn't your first venture, so I'd love to hear what are some insights, things that you have learned uh, that another entrepreneur and another uh, leader could maybe glean from, whether it's the initial startup, how do you get from idea to, to launch or getting your first couple clients? What would be some of the uh, uh, hurdles that pop in your mind that you're like, that was difficult, but you were able to overcome? I would say one of the things that I see a lot when entrepreneurs come to me, especially first time entrepreneurs, is they want me to sign an NDA before they share their idea. And I will say I was like that at the very beginning where I was really afraid that someone was gonna go steal my idea and I didn't wanna share it with other people. And what I learned over time is actually the more I share my idea, the better it becomes based on the feedback that I get from people, but also based on the connections they might have from people that I can talk to, sell to, uh, get advice from and, and so on. So I think that's a, that's a huge one. One, two, three, link it, my first company. I had the idea for almost eight months. And before I went and went on my own to, to work on it full time, I would actually go to all the blogging meetups and I would talk to people and say, hey, do you advertise on your blog? You know, why not? Um, uh, and, and, and told them my idea and got feedback on the idea. And I felt like I had enough validation uh, from, from doing that primary research um, to allow me the reassurance of taking that next step and, and quitting my, my job to go focus on my first company for the first time. So I think that's a huge one. And then related, at those meetups, what I would do is I would always look for um, disconfirming evidence. So I didn't want people to tell me how great the idea was. I mean, I did, but I always would go and find out for my first company in context, what we did is we helped bloggers make money from their content. For people that didn't advertise, I would ask them why, like why? I wanted to get a better understanding of what what would what got in the way of them advertising. Um, and that really helped me in terms of being able to create segments of customers that we can go after to truly understand the pain points of not just the people who do advertise that I'm definitely gonna go after first and foremost, but also to try to get a sense of the people that don't, what's stopping them um, to explore other opportunities. So disconfirming evidence, I think we love our ideas. We want people to tell us that they love our ideas too, but talking and listening to people who don't right off the bat can be just, if not sometimes even more helpful. What then to be able to get your first couple of clients, once you got the idea and you're, and you're moving forward, um, how were you able to, with your first company, and now as you're working with your this next second venture, scale like what's some of the, the the tactics that you found have worked yeah good question i would say far and above um at the beginning it's all about learning standardizing um it, it's looking at okay what's working what's not working and then once you get enough touch point that things are working and you can actually build repeatable processes then it's time to scale because then you build up the documentation the standard uh, operating procedures and so on uh, we're actually going through that right now at Roar for Good, especially within this pivot. So we we pivoted in November of 2018. We had our beta in May of 2019. And right before COVID hit, we were right in the process of, uh, I keep saying right before COVID hit, um, but it you know had definitely had a huge impact on our business. We were looking, we were actually struggling to, to keep up with demand. Um, we had all these installations lined up, a huge pipeline in the works, and we knew that in order for us to be able to scale appropriately, we needed to have the foundation set in place so that we make less mistakes and, and grow faster. So without getting into more specifics, I would say it's, it's exciting because your whole company changes. Now it's not just a handful of people in your company. Now it's not just journalists in your company. Now you bring on more people 
as you grow, roles become more specialized. There's more managers directing, people working on the business versus in the business, being more proactive versus reactive. Um, so it's, it's really an exciting time, uh, uh, but it can be just as challenging if you're not taking the time to really dot your I's and cross your T's. For you, obviously, constantly looking for new ideas and innovating is just part of what you have to do as a leader. Where do you look for insight? Any books or audiobooks or podcasts or um, places that you read that uh, have helped you grow as a leader and, and keep innovating? Yeah, I, well, I would say the first and foremost, healthcare wasn't um, really on top of my mind because I was all focused on hotels. But the first thing that we did is we actually went into the leads that came into our website and we, we bucketed them by industry and we saw that health, healthcare was at the top. So that's why we decided to focus on the top. But in, in terms of where I get my inspiration, I belong to a couple peer groups of CEOs and that's been wonderful, not just to provide me an outlet where I can get feedback on challenges that I'm looking to overcome, but also the other CEOs share their challenges and we all get to participate and learn from their responses. So I think it's been a really great place to be able to grow uh, my, my skills. And, and plus CEO, I mean, the role is a very lonely role like knowing other people, being able to talk to them about the struggle, uh, you really do wear most of the burden. <laughs> so it's always nice to have that support. And then um, reading books, um, I used to read a lot more. Um, I don't as much, but HBR, Harvard Business Review, I, I get their newsletters and I make sure I, I take the time to go through those every day. So those have been incredibly helpful as well. I, I really believe COVID has really elevated the level of what more companies need to do to protect their employees. And uh, so before COVID, um, unemployment rates were the lowest we've ever had in this, in this country. Um, but also, um, they don't tell the, the full picture. When you look at our, our gig economy, when you look at how many people uh, have part-time jobs, multiple part-time jobs, which then means... Uh, they are not being able to survive uh, from, one, from one job or have opportunity to have a full-time role, which then means they don't have the benefits um, to also be able to have health insurance and, and, and the basic access to, to health care. Um, I think that, especially with COVID, that there is going to be a change where workers and employees are fed up with employers trying to extract as much utility from them while not taking care of their needs, while trying to make as much money from them. And I think power is gonna to start to shift to workers where they're gonna demand protection, they're gonna demand fair wages, they're gonna demand healthcare, and that companies are gonna to have to adapt and listen. Um, one of the things I've been very encouraged by is Patagonia, REI, um, Ben and Jerry's um, are basically going through an advertising freeze from Facebook. Um, and they're saying to Facebook, hey, like unless you make your platform more inclusive, um, we're not gonna spend our money here. Uh, I think there is going to be more demand of transparency from companies to do the right thing um, versus focus on profit. And I think that's a good example of big companies pulling together to use their leverage to um, seek that demand. People want to spend money that aligns with their values. And I think companies hopefully are much more aware of that, um, but also uh, uh, employers or employees want to work at companies that also align with their values. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.